It's been a decade since the release of PT, the last slice of, well, good playable media that we got regarding Silent Hill. And whilst PT short for playable teaser went nowhere as the game literally disappeared, fans had been holding out for something from this dormant franchise. Then all of a sudden there seemed to be movement within the world of Silent Hill. We had Ascension, which didn't go down very well. We've got a new mainline Silent Hill title named Silent Hill F, and we've also got the Silent Hill 2 remake to come sometime this year, being handled and developed by Bloober Team of Layers of Fear and Observer fame. But this has led fans of the series to be concerned about how Bloober are going to handle what is considered to be the crowning jewel of the franchise. And we've also got the short message, which officially released on PlayStation 5 on the 31st of January this year. And that is what we're going to be looking at in this video. Now I do have to say off the bat that I'm going to be very careful as to how I approach this explanation for the story, because as the game lets you know multiple times, the game has many depictions of that word which we are not allowed to say on here. I'll just put the disclaimer warning on here to avoid me saying any of the trigger words myself. The story in the short message was okay, but it wasn't great. However, I did feel that the handling of said subject matter and its depiction of mental health in today's society in relation to social media was handled with sensitivity and was portrayed in an accurate manner. Because of certain depictions, there will be elements of this video that I'll be blurring out. But before we begin, please be aware that there will be spoilers in this video for the short message and potentially minor spoilers for Silent Hill in general. But with all that said, let's begin. Silent Hill The Short Message is set within the fictional town of Kettenstadt in Germany. Kettenstadt itself was a small town that was once a thriving border town. There were plans to rebuild it and to revitalise it with the help of Chinese investment firms, but what happened in the past? Well, in the 1930s, Kettenstadt was home to a Japanese witch. She was literally known as the Witch of Kettenstadt. She was tied to the practice of modern-day Wicca, a pagan, earth-centred religion in which people would pray for a bountiful harvest. It's thought that due to the practice of the Witch of Kettenstadt, this is why the town prospered for a short time. It's also thought that given German and Japanese entrepreneurs working together, Western and Eastern cultural beliefs merged, and this gave rise to an increased belief in witches and witchcraft. Then, later on, it's believed that witchcraft was to blame for the town's decline, as birth rates plummeted, miscarriages rose, and the economy tanked. And the blame was placed upon the witch, with it being reported that she was hunted down and killed. However, it's said that before her death, the witch had cursed the town. So fast forward to 2008, and development was underway, but the economic instability due to the 2008 financial crash put a kibosh on the development plans, and the Japanese developed properties were abandoned. Young people in the town began to leave en masse. So they started to develop again after things picked back up, but then the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, and once again, development failed. This resulted in increased unemployment. There were plans to try and convince skilled people to move to the town, but this never materialized. Kettenstadt then basically became a town of unrealized potential and became pretty run down. It was coined the city of no hope by some. One particular apartment complex called the Villa was inhabited. I say was, as the management company responsible for the building went bankrupt and the building was eventually abandoned. Since it was built despite the efforts of the management company, the building had become a hotspot for graffiti artists to showcase their works. One renowned graffiti artist went by the name of CB, which stood for Cherry Blossom. Cherry Blossom's art seemed to resonate with other young people, though she tried to show what young girls felt on the inside, but that they are scared to show on the outside, that the cherry blossoms that she uses in her art bloom out of the scars that they bear, which represents the overcoming of past trauma. It's September 2022, and a young woman named Anita, who lives in Kettenstadt, had gone to the villa. She'd received a message from her friend, Maya. Maya is a graffiti artist and is the artist Cherry Blossom. The message says that she wants to show Anita something, so Maya asked her to go to the villa. She arrives and the place is shrouded in a thick fog. The place has become a popular spot for people who want to check out from life early. Anita seemingly blacks out and wakes up in a room somewhere in the building, but she can't remember much at all. Recalling that Maya asked her to go there, Anita searches round for her. Anita finds that she is trapped there. Inside a room, she comes across one of Maya's graffiti pieces. Anita recalls a conversation that she'd had with Maya, that she shouldn't be afraid of what she's hiding inside, not to worry what people think, and to be proud. Truth is that Anita has some serious self-esteem issues, which we'll uncover as we dive deeper into the story. 
Moving further into the apartment complex, Anita enters a room which is covered in notes, which speak to her insecurities. A woman's voice in Anita's head seems to be screaming things at her. Inside a bathroom, Anita recalls moments in her life where she has hurt herself. She steps out of that room and receives a message from her other friend, Amelie. Amelie reveals to Anita that she's concerned about her. Anita mentions that she's taking her meds. Amelie suggests therapy, but Anita says that she doesn't think therapy does much to help. Then, Amelie says that some of their classmates were hospitalised. Anita replies that those guys deserved it. Something obviously happened in relation to a bunch of young people in the town. Exiting the room, Anita spots something standing in the hallway and it rushes towards her. The complex seems to shift and change and is now a labyrinth of hallways. She's being chased by the monster, but eventually manages to escape to the safety of a nearby room. Maya texts her and asks if she is there at the building. She says that she's there in the studio. Anita mentions that there's a monster there, but there's no reply. Inside this room, she finds another of Maya's graffiti pieces. Another flashback sees Maya reveal exactly why she chooses to depict the cherry blossom. With most flowers, after they bloom, the rot sets in immediately and then they fall. With the cherry blossoms, they bloom beautiful and they fall beautiful. She explains that's how she wants her life to be. Frustrated and slightly concerned that Maya is not replying to her, Anita sets out to try and find the studio. Another message comes in from Amelie. This time she mentions college and whether or not Anita has thought any more about it. Amelie herself had been accepted into medical school at a prestigious German university. Anita responds saying she can't do it. Amelie asks Anita to give it some more thought. She reminds Anita that she's a good artist and that it could lead to a job for her and Anita responds rather angrily that she is not Maya. Another flashback reveals Maya's frustration that people in the town only see graffiti as trash doodles. She mentions that her classmates talk about her. They bully her. She expresses her desire to leave Kettenstadt. She likes that idea because with graffiti, the world is her canvas. That as long as she's with Anita, she can have fun anywhere in the world. Anita finds a door with CB on it. And this must be the studio. Stepping inside, Anita finds yet another of Maya's art pieces. Anita also finds a sketchbook belonging to Maya and another text comes in from Maya asking if she's there. But again, Maya does not respond. A canvas drops to reveal another art piece, but Anita can't work out who the image is meant to depict. She checks Maya's social media and seems discouraged by the amount of followers Maya has. Tens of thousands and loads of likes, compared to her own social media showcasing her own art, which has a little over 100 followers and barely any likes. She posts photos of herself to her personal social media and, again, barely any likes compared to Maya, leading to yet more feelings coming up depicting Anita's lack of self-worth. Amelie then calls Anita and drops a bombshell. I guess I haven't accepted Maya's death yet. Huh? Why did she jump from the villa? Why did she have to die? Maya's... dead? Wait... Maya's really dead? Uh, how... how could I forget that? Are you alright, Anita? Hello? Hello? Then... who's this? Upon exiting the studio, once again, Anita is chased by the monster. A closer look reveals that the creature is covered in cherry blossoms. Despite the creature's pursuit, Anita manages to evade it and makes it to the roof where she discovers another one of Maya's pieces of graffiti. This one seems to depict a journey to somewhere else. Before she died, Maya considered that one to be her masterpiece. Anita ponders the thought that no one will ever notice her. She steps onto the edge of the building and falls below. So it seems that Anita is trapped in some sort of loop. She wakes up and finds the villa now in an even more rundown state. Maya messages and asks if Anita found it. Trying to get her to elaborate, Maya, or whoever it is that is messaging Anita, says that she can't leave until she finds it. Messages are dotted around that echo words that Anita had been subjected to in her childhood. Checking on more of Maya's works while she wanders the apartments, she discovers they've been defaced and covered in insults. Anita is haunted by a depiction of bullies surrounding her and calling her names. These are likely the boys that Anita referred to in her messages to Amelie. 
They were potentially an online hate group, leaving hate comments on social media. Speaking of Amelie, she texts, and the previous conversation they had, well, it's gone. This really is a loop. Anita asks if Maya is really dead, and Amelie wonders why Anita is asking. She says that before her death, Maya talked about a book that she read. Anita then recalls a conversation she had with Maya. She mentions that the author of the book checked out early and that they were young, but instead of being sad, Maya seemed upbeat. Something beautiful had come from something tragic. As she puts it, enchanting. She finds herself wondering what the author was thinking before they died. And Maya mentions that Anita wrote her a letter, which is an indication as to how shy Anita was. In another flashback, Maya sees some people talking about her and using tarot cards. She mentions that a lot of people seem to be getting into it. Anita says that she doesn't believe in all that stuff, but Maya reveals something. Her great-grandmother was a fortune teller, and that people in Kettenstadt used to see her as some kind of prophet. That was until they all turned on her. In case you haven't pieced it together yet, Maya's great-grandmother was very likely the witch of Kettenstadt. Amelie messages again and she mentions her brother, that she doesn't like seeing him, that she tends to try and avoid him. So, she suggests shopping, which of course, due to her low self-esteem, Anita rejects the idea. Amelie's diary in her bedroom sheds more light. She mentions that he stares at her, and it's heavily implied that he sexually assaulted her at some point. It has done real damage to her, and she can't even bear other guys looking at her. Two months later, she mentions that her parents are fighting a lot, but she doesn't know what it's about. A second diary, dated six months later, reveals why she studies so hard because she's desperate to leave Kettenstadt and get into her first choice university. Kettenstadt was a place she thought to be special when she was little, but says there's nothing to do there. She wants to get out of there before her brother comes back. And after many months of hard work, it paid off, and Amelie got into the university she wanted. Stuff gets worse though. Her parents are bankrupt and this puts an end to her plans for university. Amelie is crestfallen as her dream is shattered and she can't bear the thought of staying there with her brother. Then. Her mother just left. Anita then strangely finds herself at school. She walks through the school and is subjected to memories of Maya being bullied, such as the word witch being painted on the floor in front of her desk. Continuing through the school and through warped memories, Anita is chased by the monster again but finds refuge in the studio. The person appearing to be Maya texts again saying, find it. Anita does find Maya's diary. She talks of having an argument with her mother, that her classmates have been bullying her, and she talks of a special person and the hope that he gave her. Looking at Maya's sketchbook again, drawings of a boy are in there, the boy that she referred to in her diary, and this triggers another memory. This time, Maya meets Amelie and a guy, presumably the guy from the sketches. Maya recognized them from her class and said that they're welcome there with her any time. The previously unfinished graffiti piece is now revealed to have been Amelie. Exiting the studio, Anita finds herself in the school library. Another flashback reveals more instances of Maya being tormented by her bullies. She picks up a book and reveals that she's been thinking about something. She gives the book to Anita and said that she wrote her impressions down in a letter. Anita finds the book in the school library and the book is from a series called I Still Wait For You and the second volume is missing. Amelie messages Anita and they discuss Maya being bullied at school but that she never brought it up. Amelie thinks that maybe Maya didn't see her as a friend. She finds the letter Maya spoke about. It's inside Anita's locker. Remember when I said I wanted to live like a cherry blossom? To be beautiful and dignified for a fleeting moment, simply by letting go of life. Daring to bloom, knowing it won't last. And so falling, in vivid color. I wish I could live like that. I want to experience true beauty, if only for a moment. I met someone who made me feel different. He showed me a whole new world, gave me hope. I honestly thought he could help me find a new me. I felt it with all my heart. But people didn't understand us. Didn't want that from us. In the end, they took my hope from me. They took him away. 
people. People who can't achieve beauty seek comfort in others. They fear anyone different. Hate them. Try to tear them down. I can't take much more of this. I wish you and I had... I wish you and I could run away together, Mamma Me. Just... me and you. So it seems the bullies wanted to prevent the boy that Maya was talking about from seeing her, so they manipulated things. Anita remembers that Maya took Amelie from her and acted like she wasn't even there. Anita then realises what she did. In her jealousy, she tried to drive a wedge in between Maya and Amelie, so she stole the letter that Maya had left in the book, and she kept it in her locker. This was the it that Maya wanted her to find. Anita then falls to her knees, distraught at the fact that her actions may have pushed Maya to delete herself from existence. Leaving the room and this manifestation of the school behind, Anita is chased by the monster again. Photos of Maya and Amelie are plastered everywhere. Anita finally makes it to safety and evades the monster, and she ends up back on the roof again. Anita realises that she now knows what Anita wanted her to find. A call with Amelie sees a tearful Anita confessing to her role in Maya's death, and she tells Amelie about the letter. She approaches the edge of the building and once again, steps off it. Anita this time wakes up in a different location, with the loop having been reset again. She sees her dead body next to her. Even if she dies, it doesn't end. Anita receives another text stating that she should find it. Another of Maya's diaries lies on some trash bags and it states that she went to the roof of the villa and she remembered a girl that jumped to her death the previous year. She found herself again wondering what went through their heads. Walking the hallways of the dark and creepy complex, Anita ends up in the home that she grew up in. At first, it seems nice. One of her mother's diaries sits on the cabinet and it states that Anita's father left when Anita was young. Her mother was a single mother of two, but was doing a good job of raising them. Anita had a brother, I say had, and we'll get to that. Then things began to fall apart when Anita's mother got a new boyfriend. The apartment became untidy and due to Anita and her brother being cold towards this new boyfriend, their mother was worried that this would scare him off. Anita would draw a picture of their family and the boyfriend wasn't in it. Nonetheless, Anita's mother is determined to raise her kids right and not like her mother. Sometime later, Anita's mother writes that her boyfriend bought some pizza over, but that Anita hated it. Then, a few weeks later, she writes that her children were acting up in front of the boyfriend. She says that maybe if they don't see the light for a while, then maybe they'll see the light in him. And then the boyfriend would complain that the banging on the closet door was making it hard for him to unwind. Yep, the mother locked Anita and her brother in the closet. The mother says that she needs to figure something out, or she's going to lose him. By this point, the apartment was in a disgusting state. Seeing that the mother's boyfriend wasn't visiting as much, she would leave her kids in the closet and would go out. She wanted to clean the place but had no energy. Eventually, one of her neighbours called child services after they heard persistent crying coming from the apartment. The mother's boyfriend wasn't even calling her now, and she blamed her kids. She finishes by saying that she's done. Truth is that after she'd locked her children in the closet and gone out on dates with her boyfriend, her son, Anita's brother, had died in the closet. The mother attempted to conceal it by hiding the boy's body and keeping it in the refrigerator. Child services then sent her a letter saying that they are coming to take her children from her. Then, the mother's dark secret is discovered after Anita managed to escape the apartment and alert the authorities with the mother being arrested. Anita falls to the floor and says that she is a curse, that the world would be better off without her. Exiting the apartment, she is chased one final time by the monster, and running around the maze-like hallways, Anita has to collect five photographs of Amelie and Maya, and this unlocks the chains on the door to the studio. Entering the studio, Anita finds another of Maya's diaries, and it states that she was going to paint the girls who jumped from the building, as she believes they left the place for something better. She mentions that she's going to put everything into the piece. She then finishes it, calling it her crowning achievement, but thinks to herself that she may not be able to top it. She imagines the disappointment round the corner, and she begins to feel sad again. Maya then stepped off the building, however this article states that her death has been ruled as suspicious, and that foul play is suspected. Anita then comes to the shocking realisation that she had been there in the villa for six months. Anita cries, and asks Maya to forgive her. The moment Anita asks that Maya just let her die, the sketchbook falls off the easel. She sees a sketch of her, and wonders where Maya drew it. 
Realising that Maya did notice her after all, Anita heads to the roof, on the way she visits her childhood memories. Standing on the roof, Anita looks at Maya's graffiti again. Anita calls Amelie and says she's sorry. She walks over to the edge, but instead of jumping, she stops herself as Amelie messages her. She says they can go shopping and talk. This leads to the fog clearing, the loop being broken, and everything going back to normal. The game then ends, and post credits it's revealed that Amelie and Anita went off to college. Or did they? Now, I have a few sort of theories when it comes to what's going on here, and they revolve around Anita and Amelie being the same person. One theory is that it was indeed Anita who went through the abuse from her mother, and she was adopted after being placed into care. In her new family, she was abused by the son of the family. This is also why Amelie's diary says that her mother isn't her real mother, because Anita is Amelie. In further support of the adoption angle, the desk from Anita's memories is the same desk as in Amelie's room, and has the very same photograph on the desk. Also, if you look at the photos on the wall in Amelie's parents' apartment, Amelie looks nothing like the rest of her family. One other slightly different theory that ties into this is that Anita went through the abuse from her mother, but different to the first theory, instead of being adopted she came up with a grandiose story and created a fantasy tale involving her friend, Amelie, when Amelie was in fact, herself. Another theory is that Amelie is the real person and Anita was made up. The grandiose tale was that Amelie created the story about Anita's abusive mother, mirroring the fact that her mother just abandoned her, and essentially created a story in which her abusive brother was killed off. During the game we can find a couple of interesting books. One of them is about social media and the desire for getting likes on their photos, and the resulting anxiety that came from that expectation, which is of course something we see Anita exhibiting during the game. The other book is more interesting. It talks about teenagers who suffer deep psychological issues caused by past experiences. It states that all teenagers in the book conceptualise those issues as grandiose stories or tales as the book is titled Children Who Turn Trauma Into Tales. A couple of examples are given, but the final page states that these tales are born out of a deep desire to escape unbearable pain and self-hatred. The greater the trauma, the more elaborate or grandiose the story is. Given what happened to Anita when she was young, I'd say that she went through an extremely traumatic experience, and this deeply scarred her. Now, sure, it is entirely possible that both girls are indeed real with their own separate lives, but the parallels are there. First off, they look exactly the same. As for why Anita seemed to be so spiky when she was asked about going to college, it was either because she was so put off the idea after her adoptive parents went bankrupt, or her self-esteem was so low that she didn't think she'd amount to anything. The friend that Maya apparently stole from Anita could have in fact been the guy Amelie was with in Flashback 6. After that flashback, Anita claims that Maya didn't even see her, that she was invisible to her. But she was there with the guy, not there with Amelie, because she is Amelie, if that makes sense. In another of the flashbacks, Maya talks about Anita writing her a letter. Of course, Anita didn't write a letter to Maya. Well, she did, but it was Amelie who wrote the letter. Maya mentions that Anita wrote a letter because she was shy, and in one of the flashbacks, Amelie can be seen and is very shy. In terms of the book, Anita had read the book herself. She states that she knows and recognises the book when she sees it in the library. That's why the book was in Amelie's locker, even though she gave it to Anita in the seventh flashback because Amelie's locker is technically Anita's locker. Anita tried to push Maya to end herself, hence why she gave her the book to read, and why she placed razor blades inside Maya's locker. She didn't physically kill Maya, but she planted the idea in Maya's head that she should end herself. This is also why when she's collecting the photos in the final chase sequence, she's hearing Amelie's words in her head, words that Amelie has been texting her, because those are her own thoughts. This is why when Maya tried to get her to show what she was hiding inside, she said that she should be proud. Due to her own trauma, she'd either disassociated herself from it, or she'd simply forgotten about it due to the meds she was taking. At the end of the game, Anita says that Amelie had always been there for her. I think that's because they are the same person. And the final statement from Anita states that the strongest animals don't form groups. They act alone, and need only themselves to survive. Despite this being false in general, this lends more weight to the theory that Amelie and Anita are the very same person, that Anita relies on the Amelie part of herself to bring out the best in her. Of course, this could be totally off, and as mentioned, Amelie and Anita could be individual people with their very own lives. 
If you agree with my theories, let me know by liking this video. Otherwise, share your own theory below, since this game can be interpreted many different ways. However, we are not done yet. So let's finish this video by talking about the Silent Hill phenomenon, as there are a few things which link this game well to Silent Hill. During the game, Anita can find a newspaper which features an article mentioning the Silent Hill phenomenon. It mentions that the rate for people ending themselves has risen, and that people report a strange fog appearing with people losing consciousness shortly afterwards. It talks about Silent Hill in Maine, USA, and an unnamed doctor stated that the fog appears to affect people who are psychologically unstable, and appears when people are in a state of high stress. It blurs the line between illusion and reality. Cases have been increasing ever since the COVID-19 pandemic. The doctor calls for a strengthening and a stronger emphasis on mental health care for young people. A similar doctor, possibly even the very same one, wrote a document in Silent Hill 2, in which he wrote about observing a patient. That the patient was experiencing the other world, the rusty, decayed world of Silent Hill, but that at the same time, the doctor was not experiencing it himself. The Silent Hill wiki gives a great example of Laura being able to see and interact with James, but not seeing the horrors that he sees. There are also the drawings of the holes. Every time Anita progresses further into the other world, there is a drawing of a hole that gets bigger and rounder every time her loop restarts. Similar to the way the hole in Henry's bathroom gets bigger in Silent Hill 4. Like other Silent Hill games, the holes seem to represent the darkness in someone's heart, or facing the horror of the unknown. At one point, Anita says that she tried so hard to forget that place, and the villa is forcing her to face her fears. It's entirely possible that the hole in the closet that Anita was supposedly locked in by her mother was an indication that there's a blurring between what's real and what's an illusion, which makes me lean more towards the theory that Amelie was the real person. There also seems to be symbols around the hole in the villa. The symbols around the hole itself are from the Nordic alphabet, the Elder Futhark, Germanic in origin. These runes in Silent Hill lore describe the Ordo Manifesto of the Order, the cult behind the strange goings on in Silent Hill. The whole is representative of the Order's symbol, the Halo of the Sun. The Silent Hill phenomenon is essentially a manifestation of someone's ego, their waking nightmare, so to speak. There is something in Silent Hill known as Full Circle. This is when a person fails to come to terms with, in this game's case, their guilt, and results in them being stuck there until they accept it and move on. Hence why the fog cleared when Anita accepted her role in Maya's death. Finally, the monster with the cherry blossoms, if it's not obvious by now, is a depiction of, and represents Anita's guilt for what happened to Maya, who of course used the cherry blossoms in her art. But anyway, that's it for this video. If you enjoyed it, then please leave a like and subscribe if you aren't already, and as I said before, leave a comment with your theories down below if you want. But for now, take care, and I will see you in the next one.